In this video, I'll do a detailed walkthrough of a common refrigerator control board, go into its functional blocks, explain its sub-circuits, highlight common failures, and point out similarities to other control boards. While some of the topics discussed here may or may not be familiar to you, my goal, regardless of your experience, is for you to know significantly more about control boards at the end of this video. A control board is a collection of circuits responsible for monitoring and controlling the system in which it's installed. This specific control board is commonly found in a popular brand refrigerator, likely familiar to many viewers. While it possesses unique characteristics, it also shares commonalities with other control boards. This, along with most control boards, has a line side and an isolated DC side. The line side includes the power supply's primary side and the subsection with the relays that switch the AC loads. The low voltage DC side comprises the power supply's secondary and its associated loads. Other functional blocks on the DC side include thermistor monitoring, DC fan control, damper control, and dispenser and display board communications. For this detailed walkthrough, I'll start with the power supply. This is where line voltage connects to the board. After passing through the fuse, L1 has a capacitor in parallel with neutral. This capacitor resists rapid changes in voltage, which reduces high frequency noise. Also, after passing through this surge resistor, more about this in a minute, neutral and L1 are in parallel with this MOV, or metal oxide varistor. This device has almost infinite resistance below a certain voltage, but approaches zero ohms above a threshold, such as 400 volts, such as in the case of a voltage surge caused by nearby lightning. Consequently, high current flows through the MOV, taking out the fuse. Next is the EMI filter, which includes a common mode choke and additional capacitors. The common mode choke functions as a specialized dual inductor that resists high frequency current spikes originating from the power supply and are present on both lines. Its purpose is to prevent such noise, which occurs on both lines, from entering the house supply. Simultaneously, it allows the low frequency cycling current of the 60 Hz sine wave to pass through without hindrance because the normal current that flows in a circle is largely ignored by the behavior of this special type of inductor. Next, the line voltage AC is rectified by a bridge rectifier composed of four diodes. This transforms the AC waveform into a full wave rectified waveform, as shown here. This signal, representing the 170 volt peak value of 120 volt sine wave, charges capacitors to approximately 170 volts DC. Initially, when you plug in the refrigerator, the capacitors try to charge instantaneously. Since by their nature, capacitors resist changes in voltage, they respond to this by drawing a huge amount of current. In fact, during the initial power on, the current surge can be upwards of 50 amps. However, to protect the fuse from blowing due to this current spike, a low value, high wattage resistor is employed. This resistor, in combination with the acceptable ESR, or equivalent series resistance, of the capacitors, effectively absorbs the energy by inducing a temporary voltage drop. Remember that voltage equals resistance times current. As a result, the fuse is protected from blowing when you plug in the refrigerator and initially charge the capacitors. Potential failures in this circuit block include diodes shorting out and blowing the fuse after a voltage surge. Additionally, the capacitors may develop a high equivalent series resistance, or ESR, causing them to be ineffective in filtering out the AC ripple of the rectified signal. As a result, the power output from the power supply could be reduced. Symptoms of such issue may include the power supply struggling to meet demands, a flashing display on the interface board, or a cyclical clunking noise. This component acts as the power supply switching element, operating in series with the primary of the transformer at high frequency. It is prone to failure, especially during voltage surges. Its purpose is to convert the DC stored in the capacitors into an AC voltage across the primary of the transformer. Consequently, an AC voltage appears across the secondary, which is much lower than that of the primary, in order to meet the system's low voltage requirements. The secondary side of the transformer is isolated from the primary side because there is no direct connection between the two windings. This prevents a direct path for the current flow between the two transformer sides. This principle is known as galvanic isolation. The AC voltage on the secondary is rectified by a single diode here, 
resulting in a 13 volt DC value stored across the capacitors. SMPS, or switch mode power supplies, require feedback from the secondary to the primary side so that the output voltage can be regulated. Feedback is provided by an opto isolator, which maintains isolation between the two sides using an LED and a photosensor. The presence of the internal LED light directly correlates with the voltage on the secondary. As the secondary's voltage increases, the optocoupler's LED turns on, telling the primary side that the secondary has reached its target voltage. Consequently, a PWM or pulse width modulation signal decreases the duty cycle of the switching element so that less voltage is induced across the transformer's primary and correspondingly across its secondary. Conversely, when the LED turns off, the PWM duty cycle increases, ultimately increasing the voltage induced across the transformer secondary. In this way, with the help of the optolator, the power supply maintains a regulated 13 volt DC output on its secondary. This 13 volt DC powers the display board, relays, fans, and other components operating at 12 to 13 volts. This common 7805 regulator, the five, meaning five volts, further reduces the 13 volts to 5 volts DC, supplying power to the microcontroller and other 5 volt dependent circuits. This power supply operates continuously to maintain constant power to the microcontroller. On the secondary side of the switch mode power supply, a common failure can occur with the filter capacitors. Due to the high operating frequency, which is greater than 10 kHz, these capacitors can be physically small yet still be required to handle substantial current. This leads to power dissipation issues, excess heat, and evaporation of electrolyte, resulting in high equivalent series resistance. Symptoms of this may resemble those of the primary side capacitor failure, with the power supply struggling to meet demands. Additionally, the resulting high frequency ripple on the secondary can introduce noise and DC loads, particularly noticeable in the fans. A common manifestation of failing secondary capacitors is a whining sound from the evaporator fan. Experienced technicians are likely familiar with this indication of SMPS failure. Central to this control board is the microcontroller, which contains a program responsible for initiating and maintaining all necessary functions to control the refrigerator. The microcontroller features numerous pins, mostly referred to as ports. Each port can serve as an input for monitoring, an output for control, or both input and output for bidirectional communication. Output ports, often used to control loads like relay coils and provide PWM signals, are typically isolated from those loads by buffers. Buffers, such as transistors, enable a small voltage or current to drive larger loads. A relay control circuit exemplifies the use of buffers, as the microcontroller's port can only supply 5 volts and source or sink a maximum of around 20 milliamps of current. This is an example of a relay control circuit where the small output of the microcontroller is used to drive a relatively high current and high voltage coil. For more information on relay control circuits, see video number one on this YouTube channel. Microcontrollers also include non-volatile memory, which retains data when bored down. This memory stores the executable code, which is the algorithm, and can hold settings and even behavioral history. Additionally, microcontrollers rely on a time base or clock, serving as the foundation for executing instructions based on the code stored in their non-volatile memory. This time base can be internal or external. The blue ceramic resonator on this board acts as the external time base, oscillating at millions of cycles per second. Issues with these time bases have been known to cause microcontrollers to run too fast or slow. If you've ever seen a microwave count down too quickly, the time base will be one of the first things I'd investigate. Most microcontrollers are powered by either 3.3 or 5 volts DC, with this particular one operating at 5 volts. The microcontroller remains powered as long as the appliance is plugged in. Microcontrollers are very reliable and as such are not a very common failure point. Beyond the power supply and microcontroller, let's explore some specific functional areas of the board. One such area is facilitated by this connector, which has a 13 volt DC output, board ground, in a bi-directional communication line. It handles communication with the dispenser board and with the user interface when applicable. This connector interfaces with the temperature control board on the encoder models, facilitates control of the damper motors, 
and controls the three-way valves on the dual evaporator models on the 10956 board version. The temperature controls on the encoder model provide an output that is interpreted by the microcontroller. Encoders create a specific format of data, such as binary. For example, in a binary encoder, four lines can support 16 different values, or 0 through 15. Setting the knob for 2, for example, produces this output. Setting it for 7 produces this output. This binary data is easily read by a microcontroller and interpreted as a desired temperature setting. Multiple temperature controls can be read at different times using a method called multiplexing. This enables one control and disables the other and vice versa. In this way, the number of wires connected to the controls can be kept to a minimum. To control the dampers, these ICs, known as H-bridges, are responsible for controlling the directional movement of the damper motors based on commands from the microcontroller. In electronics, H-bridges find various applications, namely for electrically reversing the polarity of loads. Here is a diagram illustrating their concept. Typically, H-bridges consist of four switches, which, in semiconductor form, are implemented by transistors. Opening the damper requires closing switches S1 and S4 simultaneously, which results in this polarity. Reversing the motor and closing the damper involves closing switches S2 and S3, effectively changing the motor's polarity in the circuit. Leaving all switches open turns the motor off. All these functional states can be accomplished with just two control lines from the microcontroller. H-bridges are also used on control boards to reverse the direction of single-phase induction motors by effectively reversing the polarity of the start winding relative to the main winding. This can easily be implemented by using two SPDT or single pole double throw relays as shown here. Once the motor starts, the main winding sustains the initiated directional rotation. On this board, the H-bridge ICs additionally serve as buffers between the higher voltage damper motors and the low voltage microcontroller ports. As mentioned before, the use of buffers is common when a microcontroller is involved. This connector serves as the input for the various thermistors. A 5 volt DC common line connects to all thermistors, while each of the thermistors' other sides connect to pins 1 through 4. The output of each thermistor connects to the microcontroller through a resistor network like this that forms a voltage divider. The port is connected to this point. As the thermistor warms up, its NTC, or negative temperature coefficient, causes its resistance to reduce in value. This causes the voltage here to increase. Conversely, as it cools down, the voltage decreases. This output voltage is fed into an analog to digital, or A to D, converter, which converts the value into a binary representation that the microcontroller can understand. It is then compared to a lookup table stored in the microcontroller's memory. This allows the microcontroller to determine the temperature of each thermistor and take appropriate action based on that information. This connector is designed for interfacing with pulse width modulated DC fans. It supports multiple fans, including evaporator, condenser, fresh food, and custom cooled DC fans, depending on the model. The connector provides a 12 to 13 volt DC output to power the fans a common board ground, and four PWM outputs. The duty cycle of each PWM signal, controlled by the microcontroller, determines the speed of the corresponding fan. Higher duty cycles, and thus average higher voltage outputs, result in higher RPM. These PWM signals from the microcontroller's ports are only 5 volts with low current capability. As such, they are buffered by these transistors, which increase the current output and allow for 12 volt operation for the fans. In the case of the evaporator and condenser fans, power resistors are placed in series with the PWM signals. The presence of stressed or overheated power resistors often indicates failing fan motors. Additionally, the evaporator fan features a feedback line that allows the microcontroller to interpret the RPM and fine-tune its speed control for more precise air circulation. This section represents the aforementioned AC side of the board, responsible for housing the power supply's primary side and powering all AC loads. The loads are controlled by relays, each featuring a 12-volt coil. The coil is activated by a buffer IC, which incorporates transistors. This buffer IC enables the microcontroller's ports, capable of only supplying 5 volts maximum at a current of around 20 milliamps, to be able to switch the 12-volt DC relay that requires currents in excess of 75 milliamps. 
Relays also provide isolation between the DC and AC sides of the board through the air gap between the coil and the relay contacts. This relay switches a single phase compressor on and off. This is your defrost relay. Additionally, these relays are responsible for switching the AC solenoids for dispensing and cubed ice, as well as controlling the auger motor. In this board section, common failures are often linked to the relays. The contacts tend to wear out over time and develop higher resistance. The current passing through these contacts causes heat dissipation at the contact point. This heat can then affect the board's associated solder connections, putting them under stress and eventually leading to connection failure. Symptoms of such failures may include a compressor that fails to start or a defrost system malfunction. While that covers the details of the board, it is important to note that in this model, the DC, or low voltage ground, is not connected to the chassis or earth ground. So when troubleshooting or measuring voltages on the low voltage side, you would use board ground rather than chassis ground. Not all boards are floating like this. Some power supply grounds are bonded to the chassis. However, in these cases, any current flowing out of the DC supply will only flow through the chassis in an attempt to return to its source, which is the low voltage power supply. Also note that when measuring voltages on the primary side of the power supply, you will reference neutral, until the voltage is rectified, that is. Once rectified, a virtual ground is created by the bridge rectifier. That virtual ground would be the basis for DC voltage measurements on the primary side of the power supply. Note that you will never want to use the low Z mode of a voltmeter when measuring voltages in this section of the power supply primary. Because the delicate balance of the SMPS power supply's operation can be severely impacted by the relatively low impedance of the meter. While this board features a switch mode power supply SMPS, many boards employ a simpler linear power supply that still provides isolation between the primary and low voltage secondary sides. Linear supplies are less complex, that is they need no feedback, have less components, and run at a much lower frequency, but they are less efficient. For a detailed explanation of different control board power supply types, please refer to video number 8, Control Board Power Supplies. That's it for this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel.